Let's imagine an example. For example, I am raising a dog from a puppy into adulthood, and I'm recording his weight and how much food he eats every day, and I put all these data into a table. And if I want to further study the relation between these two variables, I can plot the relation. So the first column is my x variable, and the second column is my y variable. And when I plot them on this Cartesian plane, as we already learned, this can represent a function. In this case, the y variable, the output, is how much food he eats, and the x variable, the input, is his body weight. Therefore, this function is food as a function of weight, which indicates that how much food he eats depends on his weight. In other words, this function explains to me that it is because my dog is gaining weight, therefore he is eating more and more food. But I can change my opinion. I can say, what if it's the other way around? What if it's because he is eating more and more? That's why he is gaining weight. Therefore, I am looking at exactly the same data, but I'm switching the order of the two columns. And now, the amount of food he eats is my x variable, and his body weight is now the y variable. And I can plot these points again on the same Cartesian plane. And now, these represent a new function. That his weight is a function of how much food he consumes every day. In other words, weight depends on amount of food. These two functions look different, but they are somehow related. On the graph, as you can see, they are symmetric about a 45 degree angle line, which is the y equals to x line. These two functions are known as inverse functions of each other. Inverse functions. Study the same data by providing opposite point of view by treating different variable to be the independent variable. Let's use this very simple example to derive a four-step strategy to find the inverse function algebraically for n given、uh, original function f x in this case equals to two x plus one, and its inverse function is denoted by f. With a power index of negative one. So, the first step is to rewrite the f x into y. So now we have y equals to two x plus one. The second step is the most important step: is to exchange the x and y variables. Remember, in the puppy example that I showed you earlier, how do we get the inverse function? We switched the order of the dependent and independent variables. So here we need to switch the two variables. And now, from this expression, we need to solve for y as expression of x. This is relatively easy. Solving from this equation, y equals to one half x minus one half. And then, last step is to simply rewrite this y into f inverse x, and that is the inverse function for our original function, f x equals to two x plus one. Keep in mind that these two are mutual inverse functions of each other. Now let's go through some very important properties of inverse functions. The first one. The graphs of inverse functions are always symmetric about the 45 degree angle line or the line with the equation y equals to x. So, using our previous example, if we plot our original function f x equals to 2 x plus 1 on this Cartesian plane, and we plot its inverse function on the same Cartesian plane, as you can see, these two graphs are symmetric about. The y equals to x line, and this tells us that since if the function has inverse function, then the graph of its inverse function must be mirror image with respect to the 45 degree line. Therefore, only one-to-one -one functions can have inverse functions. One-to-one -one functions means that 
for any given independent variable x value, there could be exactly one and only one corresponding y value. In other words, this function must pass not only the vertical line test, but also the horizontal line test in order to have an inverse function. The second important property, the domain of the original function is the range for its inverse function, and the range for the original function is the domain for the inverse function. And lastly, for the two functions that are inverse functions of each other, it must satisfy that they are composite functions. Doesn't matter if it's f composed with f inverse or f inverse composed with f function. They not only need to equal to each other, but they both equal to x. If we take these two that we derived earlier as an example again and perform the composite functions f composed of f inverse, or f inverse composed of f, in either case, we will be able to get x back. Let's look at this example. We need to find the inverse function for the original function fx equals to x squared. But pay attention to the domain. It is clearly stated that x can only be smaller or equal to zero. Therefore, this function now is a one-to-one -one function, and its graph will pass not only the vertical line test, but also the horizontal line test. So it does have an inverse function. So you can follow the four steps to try to find the inverse function algebraically. Step one, rewrite fx as y. Step 2, exchange x and y. Step 3, solve for y as expression of x. And last step, rewrite y as the inverse function. But you will run into a problem if you do the algebra correctly, that your conclusion will be the inverse function equals to either positive or negative square root of x. And that's simply impossible. That is not a specified function. But we can use the help from the graph. Because x must be smaller or equals to 0, this function is only the left half of the squaring function. And as you can tell from the graph, that the domain of this function is from negative infinity to 0, including 0. And the range of the function is from 0 to positive infinity. Now, because if two functions are mutually inverse functions of each other, the domain of one is the range of the other. The range of one is the domain of the other. Therefore, we can tell that for the inverse function, its domain now must be from zero to positive infinity, including zero, and its range now must be from negative infinity to zero, including zero. And also we know that the inverse functions have graphs that are symmetric about the 45 degree line. Therefore, we can graph it. And with the help of the graph, as well as the domain and range information, we can determine that the inverse function can only be negative square root of x. Lastly, let's look at this example and determine its inverse function using the algebraic method following the four steps. Step one, again, rewrite fx as y. Step two, again, the most important step, exchange x and y. y becomes x, x becomes y. Step three, solve for y as expression of x from this equation. For this type of problem, we first multiply both sides by the denominator 2y minus 3. Therefore, on the left, we have x multiplied by 2y minus 3. On the right, we have y plus 2. For the left side, multiply it out, we got 2xy minus 3x equals to y plus 2. And now, let's collect any term with y to the left and any term without y to the right. Therefore, the left side, we will have 2xy minus y. The right side, we will have 3x plus 2. Now, pull out the y as a common factor on the left. We get y 
multiplied by 2x minus 1 equals to 3x plus 2. And now divide both sides by 2x minus 1. We got y equals to 3x plus 2 divided by 2x minus 1. And that is y as an expression of x. And then last step, simply rewrite y as f inverse. And we get f inverse x equals to 3x plus 2 divided by 2x minus 1. And that is the inverse function of the original function. And if we want to test algebraically to see if they are indeed inverse functions of each other, we can find their composite function. It doesn't matter if it's f composed with f inverse, it will give you x, or f inverse composed with fx, it will give you x as well. And that's how we know these two functions are indeed inverse functions of each other.